11 o'clock rock, I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. Welcome to Creative Contributions here on a given Friday. Today we'll talk about a manuscript that defines a man I know and a notable period in American history which we should all know about. He and it, they are about the Piss Corps. That means Peace Corps, the way you pronounce it in India in the 1960s. Uh, right about the time when the Vietnam War was happening with all its destructive implications, while the war was destructive, the Piss Corps was just the opposite. When I graduated from NYU Law School in 1965, first I went into the graduate program there in that school, which was not protected from the draft. When they came for me, I answered with my own move, go into the service that saves lives, the Coast Guard. I could have, done, I could have gone into the Peace Corps just as easily, I think, and some of my friends, I recall one, his name was Matt Seymour. I don't know if Peter knows him. He was my co-graduate counselor at the dormitory at NYU. I was dazzled with his move, um, but I, I love the idea that he went. And today, all I have is the memory of him in his 20s, along with me and his name, Matt Seymour. Now, Peter Adler answered the call by going into the Peace Corps, and it certainly changed him. More than that, he decided to write it up, and we're here today to talk about his wonderful, heart-rending lessons and experiences uh, in living the life of the most exciting global adventure that came out of John Kennedy and the optimism of the early 1960s and global optimism that we can look at today, that our generation at the time could ever have. That was the time. Peter was, at the core of it, incredibly lucky to be there in the mainstream of those experiences and we are incredibly lucky to be able to talk with him and soon enough to have the benefit of his recollections and stories and his manuscript and book about the experiences that defined his life and certainly have enlightened and do enlighten ours. Welcome to the show, Peter. Adler. Thank you, Jay. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Let's get started. Yeah. Tell us the story of how you got involved in the Peace Corps in 1960. Six. Right. It's late 1966. I've graduated from college. I uh, have a BA in history. I'm uh, not clear about what I want to do, but I knew I also did not want to fight in that war. Not, I'm not against all wars, but that war, the Vietnam conflict, which is our era, which most people think could be like the war of the Turks and the Hungarians in 1500 these days. You weren't a wild activist or anything. You, you uh, weren't. mildly. My, my well, I, I mean, I was like in, I was, I in, was like and I protested, and I was involved in that, and yeah. uh, active in that. But graduating, I wanted to do something different. Yeah. Uh, the draft board was after me. I wound up applying for the Peace Corps. Didn't think I'd get in. Got in and got a deferral for the time that I was in the Peace Corps. As soon yeah. as I finished, they came right after me again. Oh, no, of course. How unfair! Oh, well, gee, it was what it was. The service, and they came for you. Anyway. Oh yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Gee whiz. Yeah. <laughs> So, so anyway, so talk about training and uh, acclimation and immersion, if you will. Okay, so it's, it's uh, 1966, late 1966. I'm invited to participate in this training program for India in a place that I'd never heard of called Maharashtra State, which is between, this is where Bombay is, the main city. And uh, we were going to be trained in construction and public works. I'm a, I was a history major, but I, said, I can, I can that. do that. I can do that. If Jay can be a lawyer, I can do that. So um, went in the training. We spent a couple weeks in Milwaukee at a hotel and then took a train down to Zapata, Texas, which is uh, and right on near Laredo on the, on the Tex-Mex border. And we spent two and a half months down there with our language instructors. We built our own. We were being taught construction skills, built these hovels, and uh, got our instruction and then went through the process of selection, had lots of interviews. Some, uh, many of us got deselected at that point, and about 50 started in the program, 24, 25 actually made it through there. It's exclusive. It was. It was, it was high, high expectations, yeah. high requirements. Yeah, yeah but the basis of it, it was mysterious to all of us. <laughs> it was like the end of it was the night of the long knives. Nobody understood exactly why <laughs> too bad. and how. Yeah, so then we packed off to India in January of 1967 and spent the next two years in. I was in a village of about 7,000 people, kind of a county seat, if you will, uh, that is now a commercial center of 35,000. I was back there a right? few years ago. What was the name of the village? Ked. Ked. H-E-D. Ked. And it was west of Mumbai? Well, it was actually between Mumbai and Goa. Okay, Goa is on the water, so that's yeah. south so it was of Mumbai. close to the coast. Yeah, I was okay. about 10 miles from okay. the ocean. 
you know, India is a lot different today than it was then. What was India like then? You know, um, I, having been back a couple of times in the last few years, today it's full of motorcycles, cell phones, high technology. There's still massive poverty there. Uh, there's probably more cell phones than toilets in India, but um, <laughs> it's, it's changed. And there's a very quick rising middle class that's overshadowing caste structure, which was very, you know, old and antique and... But uh, people are on the move. This is a country on the move if they can overcome their corruption. Well, you gave us some photos. Let's look at a slight photo show over here. We have a few photos sort of to define the times. That's the uh, picture of the cover sheet of your book, India 40 and the Circle of Demons. It is a manuscript by Peter S. Adler. It is a manuscript of 363 pages. <laughs> All very interesting, by the way. <laughs> Talk about the photos. Go to the net. Yeah, so this is the, the there's kind of two pieces. There's the physical journey. What did we do? So the context, the war in Vietnam, I had a lot of friends that had been drafted. Some were being killed, so many were being wounded. Uh, I was clear that that's, if I could avoid it, I wanted to do that, but I wanted to do national service. I wanted to do something. Uh, 50 of us invited to train. That's a photo of the actual site we were in, this ranch, godforsaken ranch on the border. Uh, 24 of us started in January 1967 and 12 when we called ourselves the Dirty Dozen who actually finished. And we were kind of a dirty bunch, to tell you the truth. <laughs> you remember them? I do. We're still close. I mean, we, yeah. Are they still alive? No, a few have passed away. Yeah. Uh, but we get together at least once every year, year and a half. We just got together actually to commemorate the passing of one of our colleagues. You know, uh, I, I judged from the book and the prologue and the epilogue and all that that this has defined your life, and I think I'm right no matter what you say. Um, the question is whether it defined the, other, the lives of the other 11 people in your dirty dozen. It was it? a very significant moment for all of us. All of us have done many other things. I mean, we have attorneys and we have executives and we have all kinds of people who have done a lot of other things. But this was one of those fork-in-the-road experiences when you look back. You couldn't see it while you were there. But this is a moment when we're all going down a fork that becomes really important in hindsight. Yeah, historical. Yes. Not only for you, but for the country. Because you were an extension of John Kennedy, John yeah. F. Kennedy. That's right. And, uh, you know, perhaps in, to our generation, it was probably the greatest thing that he could do for us to give us this opportunity. Unfortunately, it went away. And that's another story we'll talk about later. Um, but, you know, you, you mentioned an outer journey and an inner journey. Let's talk about the outer journey first. What was it for you? So that's the physical part of going to a new culture, uh, having grown up in the bubble of American culture in Chicago, south side of Chicago, and uh, all of a sudden going out into a world that was completely new, a culture that was completely new. This wasn't culture shock. This was life shock. This is learning about death, disease, hunger, Poverty. It wasn't all pretty. It wasn't all no, romantic. It wasn't. No, it wasn't. But I also go, you also get accustomed to it, and you have to work within it. You have to get a few things done as best you can. Were you were you scared? Were you afraid? Were you, you know, concerned about your own health and welfare and survival? Yeah, we got. We all got sick, but kind of too stupid to to <laughs> be that concerned. I mean, we're just living it. And You're all in, the, in your early twenties. Yes, we're all 20, 21, 22. And uh, having a great adventure on one hand, and the other trying also to get a few things done in, in a place that was hard to work in. How did you spend your time? Um, you know, we started out attached to a uh, kind of a public works program. The idea of which was to take uh, off-season agricultural labor, put them to work on a public works project, and we were supposed to you know, design and build projects. And we did. We did school construction some market roads, uh, little wells, and community health centers, but the program was a bust. Just really? to be clear, the program was a bust, so we all wound up also doing other things. So I wound up also raising chickens, and a kid from Chicago raising chickens, why that's interesting. Yeah, well, why not? Talk about broadening your... Yeah, and you killing know. rats. We killed lots Kill of rats. rats are good. Yeah. That's a good thing. So do. we wound up doing things, and then we were in a very heavy monsoon area, so 300 inches of rain in three, four months. Most work stops. Most work stops. What do you do with your time then? Read a lot of books. I got the That's education okay. that I'd missed in college. Yeah, right. Yeah, in depth. Depth. yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> exactly. So you said you said the program failed. What exactly was the program? What are you supposed to bring in a program like that? What was your value added to the people in the village? The, and the, why did it not work? The theory of it was that we were to be attached to this um, 
uh, rural manpower program is what it was called. This again, grabbing ag off-season agricultural labor, paying them a wage, putting them to work on building roads and schools and uh, you know community centers. And the program was riddled with corruption from the top to the bottom. In all in the Indian the, village. Yes, in in the whole program nationally. And in so the, in the Peace Corps program. Yeah, not not ours. Okay. I mean, our program we were simply attached to it as part of a political oh, deal. So the mirror image, image Indian program. The Indian which, program was a problem. Okay, got it. And you know, here we were, twenty-two year old, uh, you know, three month wonder kids, and there I was working for a very skilled engineer who became one of my closest friends, and he was underneath the political guys. And uh, he was actually one of our guardians. He kept a peripheral eye on us, made sure we didn't screw up too badly. But uh, the program itself was a complete bust. I mean, there was so much corruption. So one of the things we did was we raised some independent money to build schools, and we became the project uh, managers. And they couldn't get their hands on it, but they loved it. They loved it. People loved these little rural villages needed schools. And, and they, they needed it. you. Yeah. So when, in the yeah. building of the school, you brought them certain skills they didn't have. That's right. A lot of project management, project organization, and most of all, we brought some funding that we wrangled out of the United States. So interesting. You know, we, we some time to time, we do Aloha Medical Mission. Yeah. And they do these medical missions uh, in Nepal and other places, and they run into exactly the same thing. That's right. They're high-minded, you know, they're totally common good, and yet they find that there's a, there's a mirror image organization that is corrupt, and slows it all down. That's right. That's exactly. And maybe right. in a certain sense, this happened elsewhere. You spoke in your book about um, the Peace Corps in Africa. I will bet the same thing happened there. A lot of places. And, uh, maybe it was um, a, a failure in the original concept, not to be able to deal with corruption at the local level. Then. So the, the Peace Corps had, you know, from the Kennedy point of view and Hubert Humphrey and Sergeant Shriver, the architects of it, they said we wanted to do several things. We wanted to send young people abroad, the, and good people who could do things and show people that we weren't just warriors in Vietnam and fighting a war. So we wanted to send people there to learn about their culture and participate in it. We wanted them to learn about us, the human exchange part. Uh, and those were core to the mission. And that was more important than, than building the school, as and a matter of fact. That's right. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, I was just talking to the director of the Peace Corps recently, and she said, yeah, so what? The fish died in your fish pond. Who cares? You did. Look at the great things you did. I mean, <laughs> you know, I mean, that, we all have those failure experiences. And we also have successes, and that's all part of growing up, too, isn't it? Yes, it is. What a place to grow up, actually. Yeah. Nothing could be finer. We're going to take a short break, Peter. We come back, I want to talk about some of the, you know, more challenging things that happened while you were over there, some of the trouble you had, and how you dealt with it. And Peter Adler, he is defined by his experience in the Peace Corps between 1967 <laughs> and 68. And so when you look at him and shake his hand and say hi, always think of that. The Piss Corps. <laughs> we'll Piss be right back. <laughs> Aloha, my name is Justine Espiritu and I co-host Hawaii Farmers Series with Matthew Johnson of Oahu Fresh. We talk about Hawaii's local farmers and their supporters. In order to have a vibrant and sustainable local food system, uh, farmers are always the foundation, but there's so many other people uh, involved in the community that help support those farmers. So we bring those folks onto our show every Thursday at 4 p.m. We get their backstory, their history, find out a little more about them, and we find out why they love what they do and their perspective and their advice on how we can continue to have a dynamic and vibrant and sustainable local food system. So we, again, we broadcast live every Thursday at 4 p.m. And you can also catch us on ThinkTech's YouTube channel as well as Alelo54. So we hope you tune in and join us. Hey, we're back. We're live with Peter Adler, a, a member of the Peace Corps in 1967 and 8, and a person who can tell us how it was like, what it was like in those days. It wasn't all halcyon, was it? I mean, there were problems in those days. I mean, think of, you know, right across the bay, you had Vietnam with all those drugs and all the trouble that those young people were having. You also had trouble in India, no? We um, did. Drugs, you had um, mental issues. Um, you had some suicides going on there. Can you talk about the dark side yeah, for a so, minute? So we, we were a hard luck group, which is one of the things I wanted to write about. Because Peace Corps, everything's kind of noble and vaunted and up on a stage. And this was a very hard luck group. We had huge amounts of loss. One guy did commit suicide. 
and we still get together, my group, and we scratch our heads, well, why'd that happen? We had several guys who went home on drug uh, overdoses or drug use. Um, everybody had a lot of sickness. I mean, we were, you know, from Chicago and New York and California, and all of a sudden you're in what is basically a Petri dish. And so we all had various germs and bugs and worms. Peace Corps doctors were very good. They tried to take care of us. Mm -hmm. um, one guy in our group, and there's a story about him, uh, came down with an extraordinarily virulent hepatitis. Uh, his liver completely stopped functioning. He was uh, expatriated to the good ship Hope on off oh, sea line. Yeah, medical ship. Co yeah. First complete blood transfusion, written up in Time magazine. So, so there are individual stories about what happened. It was hard. There were hard moments, but there was also these kind of great joyous moments with in your community with people and well, people you know. That takes us to the inner journey that you talked about. Right. Can you talk about that for a minute? I can, yeah. So uh, this book, you have to remember this is both memoir and a little bit of a creative nonfiction. I've embellished some things and at the end I own up to what I've embellished. So it's not... <laughs> I noticed history. that. I thought yeah, that was very good of yeah, you. Yeah, I wanted to say so we, well, have, we have mostly nonfiction here. But, but Peter says in the book, well, in order to make it more readable, I had to add some stuff that I was a composite that's right. <laughs> you know, that turned into be a little bit fiction. <laughs> no, you, yeah. So, I mean, I wanted to tell a good story. I mean, I wanted to also tell a pretty good story in this yeah. thing. Yeah. So, yeah, there were, there, the inner journey was really uh, understanding not so much about, I came to understand not just Indian culture, but I really learned about how American I was. And I wasn't aware of it. We think, you know, culture, we just adapt to everybody else, or they adapt to us. And I realized, oh, no, no, that's not how this, the world works. I also went there full of dualisms. There's right and wrong, there's good and bad, there's a good war, there are bad wars. And that changed me. The Indian experience changed me to think of it much more nuanced and the shades of gray, which I is important as a mediator I, I live in that world too yeah that's true that, i live in that world and maybe that's one of the reasons you're a good mediator that you learned about the shades of gray it is and it's about that but that that's the 22 year old transition from yeah. i know what's right and wrong to well i'm not so sure about that and i better explore this it's more nuanced than i thought yeah that that's, that's a wonderful that, lesson for yeah. a young person to have yeah. and I, I can just say in the book one of the things i've done is created these dialogues uh, imaginary dialogues with one of the uh, main gods from India, Shiva. And I didn't grow up with lots of religion. One with the snakes. Yeah, he's the one you see in dancing, doing the cosmic <laughs> dance, and he's going to. Many arms. He's a god of destruction. I mean, he brings the world, uh, destroys it so a new world can be born every seven bazillion years. And so I have these dialogues in which he keeps telling me, You're pretty stupid. You don't understand this, you don't understand that. And you don't even understand about women. You don't understand about love. What's wrong with you? So <laughs> yeah. there's these dialogues. That can you read some of your sure. stuff? Yeah, yeah, I'll read you one. And this is actually in a chapter that's the story of how I met my wife. And it's a dialogue. And it started actually first with a friend telling me about the meaning of that Nataraja, the, the dancing Shiva. Uh -huh. And then uh, he tells me that you can go to the... You okay. go to one of the pictures. Yeah, I'll show it to have you. a picture of Shiva. Yeah, I do. I have a, a picture there in one of the steps. Okay, the inner so, journey. Yeah, and if you see on that Nataraja, there, he's got one foot on this dwarf. And the dwarf is called Apsmara, and the dwarf is ignorance. And Shiva is all about enla bringing enlightenment. He, uh -huh. There are many things. It's not just destruction. He does that too. But so this is ignorance. So this is about learning a little bit about love and finding, meeting my wife and courting her. Uh -huh. She was also a Peace Corps volunteer. Oh, is that right? Yeah. I, 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 your, your life has been defined. <laughs> <laughs> it's still is in some ways. So here's this dialogue with Shiva. Because I, I had written earlier that, you know, he was kind of a, a, a bastard. He was a, you know, kind of a warlike maniac and killing people. And but you can learn from him. He says, so Shiva says, you really think I'm just an egotistical murderous bastard? me. Well, you've been eavesdropping on my conversations. Well, of course, I listen to anything I want. For an engineering man, your friend Bal Kellisker has some excellent ideas, but you are still an idiot. I keep telling you things and you don't listen. Like what? I've said this before. Everything that commences must end. Anything born must die. Anything strong becomes weak. Anything that rises will fall. Uh, well, what's so hard to understand about that, Mr. Shiva? It's what lies between the rise and the fall that you are completely missing, especially with women. It's because you're a nincompoop. You keep thinking everything is either or, old or new. Well, I ask, and then I ask him, is that true with you? 
When you turn to love, all things in the world tremble. In fact, the world trembles. That's what you haven't yet discovered. Why is that? And he says, because you are uncommonly stupid. <laughs> so there's these dialogues that go on throughout, as I'm trying to learn. You're, you're writing them or someone else? I wrote them. This is yours. It's <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> you put yourself in the skin of Shiva himself. <laughs> I'm trying to have a discussion with Mike, with the God, the local God. Could be any God. I love it. And that, and does, you know, that does give us an idea about the style of writing in your book. <laughs> give us another one, will you? Sure. Um, actually, I'll go back and read something. And this is just in, up at the beginning of it. And it's uh, trying to capture a little bit about how quirky and interesting and strange and confronting India was. An Australian public health doctor I met in Japan on a hike in the Kiso Valley told Carolyn and me that he'd been to India and worked there for several extended stays. Over dinner uh, and sake, he, we exchanged peculiarities. He says, every day you are presented with something wondrous. One day there was a man standing in the middle of the road with two big bears on chains, holding up traffic until drivers would pay him money to move. Then he told me about the time he was on a bus going up a mountain and someone in the center aisle got sick and people passed him to the window horizontally so he could vomit. <laughs> I mentioned a procession to the burning pyres along the Ganges with a dead woman on a plank wrapped in a white sheet headed into the fire and a hired band was following her playing for he's a jolly good fellow. So there's these just like, you know, mind benders. There's things going on there. Uh, so there's the well, your whole, example. Your whole book, your, your writing style, your references, you know, there are philosophical references and literary references all this all through this book. And what, what I get, I mean this as a compliment, Peter, <laughs> is that you're kind of a hippie come current. <laughs> a, a hippie who read a lot in order to have all these references and literary, you know... It was a long monsoon in which we had a lot to read. <laughs> really? Yeah, it was. <laughs> and so it's, a, it's very actually sophisticated, just as the experience itself was sophisticated. So let me, let me ask you this, and this is going to be hard for you, but um, how did it change you from what you were before to what you you are now in the book if I read the book carefully I, I think I can get my own answer but how would you answer that I think 22 years old first you think you're immortal second of all you're cocksure about everything and that changed I knew I wasn't immortal by the time I came back I knew that the world was more liminal and nuanced and subtle and that uh, that's something that I can't hard to describe but, but that's those lessons are useful right here in the United are. States of America and they right? stop anywhere actually yeah. And there were things that reinforced it. And, and so it's uh, not that I'm afraid to make decisions in life, and not at all, but I just have been very patient and curious, like you, about the human condition and want to understand the, some of the details and nuances of it. Okay, and those, those lessons, you know, the, the study of patience, the incorporation of, of patience as an essential char and of character point, have they helped you in dealing with your publisher? <laughs> So the status of this is, it's a manuscript, I'm getting close to finishing. I have uh, my friend and colleague Katie Randy is doing a lot of editing on this. I've done lots of, people have given me really helpful ideas and sometimes some scorching criticisms, all of which are useful. I plan to finish this up. Uh, I am in, the, I've got some inquiries out to agents and public, publishing houses. It's probably a dead end because the whole world of publishing is churning and changing. And in the end, I will probably uh, publish it independently. So many people do these yeah, days. Yeah, and, and that's part of the change in the publishing world. Yes. That it's one of these trends, and it, as you guys know, stuff has migrated onto the internet. The publishing business is very different. Those big houses are consolidating or going out of business. And Amazon is, is arising. Amazing. Yeah. And yeah. a few others, too. Yeah. And, and, the, and there are very few, the bookstores are going away, with a few exceptions. There are some local niche ones, bookends in Kailua, and a few others that are neighborhood-based. Who's your market on this book? Uh, that's really good. I think it's going to be Jay Fidel. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be Jay Fidel. Well, one, one copy I can assure you of that, Peter. <laughs> so, no, I think it's going to be people who um, uh, probably lived out in during that same era and are kind of looking back and thinking about it. It will certainly be former Peace Corps people who have probably gone through similar experiences. Um, and guys like me who watched the Peace Corps, who yeah. um, wanted to be in the Peace Corps, you know, somehow, who admired the Peace Corps for all the years that it existed. You made a reference earlier to the fact that there still was a Peace Corps. Is there still a Peace it Corps? It is still around. But it's not, not nearly as robust as it was in these no, days. it's still strong. And there's yeah. like 200 and quarter of a million people have gone through the Peace Corps. Yeah. In one place, or, you know, in Latin America, Africa, Asia, South Asia. Uh, there, so it's still there. 
God knows what will happen to it in the next couple of years. Got to be funded. But it, yeah, but it, it has survived, and it, and probably because the core ideas are sound. Yes, it's had ups and downs. Uh, people have died in the Peace Corps. People have been lost for sometimes wrong reasons. Yeah. Um, it's still around, but the countries have changed. So India, for example, there were 5,000 volunteers that have gone through India, but India basically has dumped the program. Yeah. And they said, we don't need it. And I can understand that because they have their own cadre they of doctors. They a first world teachers. country. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so, a little bit. <laughs> so, so, Peter, uh, you know, I promised that we would discuss at least to some extent the, the notion of national service. You know, uh, despite the fact that you didn't completely satisfy the draft authorities by going to the Peace Corps, <laughs> you did do national service for sure. You know, you embraced national service and for lots of good reasons. And I did my thing. And some people, you know, in those days, regrettably, they did it by, by the draft. But could you, could you turn to camera one here at the yeah. end of our show and talk about your view of national service, what it did for you? whether it's important for the country, what the country should do going forward about national service. Well, I actually have recently wrote a little op-ed piece with a, a friend of mine, a guy who was uh, in the Air Force in Vietnam while I was in India. And we struck up a friendship, and his name is Victor Kraft. And he and I wrote a little piece that said, we really should make some form of national service mandatory. And part of it is the look back and you say, this was a way that people mature in our culture. You don't mature just by staying in, you know, just doing texting and that kind of stuff. You have to get out there. And whether it's the Vietnam experience that he had uh, saving pilots or whether it was my work, and we realize there's a common under, under, you know, firmament underneath there. So I, I've become a big believer, and I think we really need to create and urge and push for these national service. Do something. Do something that's not just about you, but it's about something bigger than you. And you did it, and I did it, and Victor did it. Ask not. You may remember these words, what your country can do for you. That's right. What you can do for your country. Thank you, Peter. Sure. My pleasure, always. Thank you, Jake.